Hello everyone, and welcome back to Total Organic Chemistry. This video is the second in my series of retrosynthetic analysis practice videos. So as always, I've split this video into three reactions, one easy, one intermediate or medium, and one more difficult reaction. So if you'd like to skip to one of those, you'll find the timestamps in the video description. Before we begin, if you like some review on alcohols or ethers or the reactions that they undergo, please subscribe to my channel and take a look at my other videos on those topics. So let's get right into it. This easy reaction is the production of acetic acid, which if you might know is found in vinegar, from ethyl iodide, so a very simple alkyl halide here. Before I walk you through the solution, please pause the video here and try the problem on your own, and then resume when you think you've found an answer. With these retrosynthetic analyses, I always like to look at the number of carbons we have. So we've started with two carbons in the ethyl iodide, and we actually have the same number, so only two carbons in the acetic acid as well. So that's very simple, we don't have to add or subtract any carbons here. Another thing we can notice is that we've also added oxygen to our starting material. So we start with no oxygen, and we actually end up with two oxygen atoms in our product, which means that we have to undergo some sort of oxidation reaction. So for me, this reaction is simplest to proceed kind of backwards. So let's start with our acetic acid. And we know that we have to undergo some sort of oxidation here, like I said. So we can see that this is a carboxylic acid, and we can very easily oxidize something to a carboxylic acid. So if we take ethanol, which is a primary alcohol, we can perform a Jones oxidation with sodium dichromate, sulfuric acid in water, and a lot of times acetone is used as a solvent, and that will oxidize the alcohol all the way to the carboxylic acid. From there, it should be pretty straightforward to see the relationship between our starting material, ethyl iodide, and ethanol here. So if we take ethyl iodide and perform an SN2 reaction, we can just take sodium hydroxide in maybe a polar aprotic solvent like DMSO or DMF to form the ethyl alcohol in an SN2 process. So that's a very simple retrosynthesis for acetic acid. Let's move on to the medium or intermediate reaction here. This will be the production of 3S3-methoxy-2-butanol. So again, don't bother really memorizing this nomenclature, but I'm giving you the systematic nomenclature just to give you a taste of it and for you to see where that comes from. So this will be our product, and our starting material will be R-propylene oxide. Okay, so now go ahead and pause the video, attempt the problem on your own, and then come back when you're finished. Again, we'll look at the number of carbon atoms. So we start with three carbon atoms with our epoxide, and we actually end up with a five carbon product. So we can see that OCH3, or the methoxy group in the product, so we could probably add one carbon through some sort of alkoxide, whereas maybe another carbon could come from a Grignard reagent. We know that that's a very useful carbon-carbon bond forming reaction. We also know that we're going to have to perform a ring opening at some point in our synthesis, because we start with a cyclic ether and epoxide, and we end up with an acyclic product. Finally, we can notice that each of these molecules has a stereocenter, so we're going to have to develop some sort of stereoselective synthesis in order to retain that stereochemistry. For this synthesis, I think it's most useful to actually start from the starting material instead of go backwards. So we'll look at our R-propylene oxide starting material. And this is an epoxide, remember, so we can perform a ring opening reaction using a nucleophile. And if you remember from the reactions of epoxides, we can open this ring in either basic or acidic conditions. So let's take a look at both of those and see where each will lead us. In basic conditions, we will have, we can just write nuke minus. So some sort of generic nucleophile with a negative charge. And this will open the ring in an SN2 process, remember in basic conditions. So it will be from the less sterically hindered carbon, and it will give us this product here, where the nucleophile has bonded to the left-hand carbon. And we've again retained the stereochemistry of the other carbon. 
Okay, so that's good. What if we use acidic conditions instead? Well, then we'll be using something like h nuke, where this nucleophile is bonded to a proton, so in acidic conditions again. In acidic conditions, it's kind of the opposite, remember. So we have an SN1-like process, where the nucleophile will actually attack the more substituted center, so in this case, the right-hand carbon. And again, we'll still be retaining the stereochemistry of that methyl group. Now we can compare the structures of the products that we get from basic and acidic ring openings, compare them to the product. So we notice that the acidic product with the nucleophile attached to the right-hand carbon is actually closer to the product. So we have this nucleophile directly attached to the carbon bearing the methyl group, and the alcohol is on the other carbon. So if we choose an appropriate nucleophile, we can actually get very close to the product. And if you can see, this nucleophile will actually be the methoxide anion, so OCH3 minus. This means that our first step in the reaction will be taking the epoxide and using acidic conditions where we have methanol, CH3OH, and maybe sulfuric acid as our catalyst, and that'll give us the methoxide nucleophile. It'll open the ring, giving us this product with the methoxide group attached to this right-hand carbon here. Okay, so we've added one carbon to our starting material. We still need to find some way to add another carbon. So we see that we need an additional methyl group on this left-hand carbon that has the alcohol group on it right now. So we can think maybe we need to eventually get to a Grignard reaction, which means that we'll need to add to some sort of carbonyl group. So we only have a CO single bond, whereas we need a CO double bond to perform a Grignard reaction. So let's oxidize this alcohol using our PCC reagent, so that's pyridinium chlorochromate, in probably dichloromethane as a solvent, to get to the aldehyde here. So we will still retain the stereochemistry of the right-hand carbon, but we'll have oxidized that alcohol to an aldehyde. And remember, I'm using PCC here instead of the Jones reagent of dichromate in sulfuric acid, because the Jones reagent will over-oxidize this primary alcohol to the carboxylic acid, and that will give us too many oxygens. So now we have our carbon-oxygen double bond, and we can perform a Grignard reaction here. So let's take methyl magnesium bromide, because we only need one additional carbon, in diethyl ether as a solvent, and then follow it up with an aqueous acidic workup, so H3O+, and that will reduce the aldehyde to the alcohol and add a methyl group to it. So with that, we've obtained our product. Finally, let's do this more difficult synthesis here where we're producing this cyclic molecule, 2-cyclopentyl tetrahydropyran, from 5-hydroxy pentanyl. And one caveat that I'll add in is that this hydroxy pentanyl should be our only source of carbon in the synthesis. Just as before, take a few minutes and pause the video, try to solve the problem on your own, and then come back when you think you've found a solution. So as always, let's count our carbons. We have five carbons in the starting material, in the aldehyde, and we actually have 10 carbons in the product, which means that we should be using our starting material twice throughout the synthesis. We also have two ring closings that we need to perform at some point. So we have this five-membered cyclopentane ring and we could probably synthesize that maybe using a Grignard reagent. And we also have this six-membered tetrahydropyran ring, which is a cyclic ether, which means that we may be able to synthesize that through maybe two alcohol groups and joining them together with acid. Finally, somehow we need to connect those two rings. So that carbon-carbon bond connection will probably be realized through another Grignard reaction. So with those guidelines, let's get to work. Again, this reaction is probably simpler to proceed through the forward direction, so starting with the starting material. And this is a five carbon molecule again, so maybe we can imagine trying to eventually get to a ring closing reaction, so an intramolecular ring closing. And we do have a carbonyl group, so we can imagine performing a Grignard reaction 
but we don't have any Grignard reagent yet, so let's try to make one. We can take this alcohol and halogenate it using phosphorus tribromide in diethyl ether. And you could also use hydrobromic acid in this case. Aqueous hydrobromic acid would probably give a decent yield of the bromide product here. Next, we can make the Grignard reagent using magnesium metal in diethyl ether and following up with an acidic aqueous workup. To close that ring, adding to the carbonyl and giving us the cyclopentanol intermediate here. So that's good. We've closed this first ring and we can move on to the next ring. We need to form a carbon carbon bond to this cyclopentane ring, which means maybe we could perform another Grignard reaction. So let's imagine oxidizing this alcohol to the ketone using Jones reagent, which is again sodium dichromate in aqueous sulfuric acid, and a lot of times acetone is used as another solvent. So like I said, this will give us the ketone here. And then if we perform a Grignard reaction, I'm not going to write out exactly, but maybe we can use RMGBR, so just a generic Grignard reagent, and our aqueous workup here will afford us this product, where we have the tertiary alcohol now and the R group bonded to the cyclopentane ring. This could be a problem, because now we have an additional alcohol group Whereas in the product, we don't have anything else bonded to the cyclopentane ring, just the R group. So maybe this isn't the best pathway, and maybe we could think of a more efficient synthesis. Let's go back to our cyclopentanol intermediate, and maybe do the same thing we did with the starting material, so form a Grignard reagent from this alcohol. Again, we could use phosphorus tribromide in diethyl ether, as well as hydrobromic acid could also accomplish the same thing. And this would give us the cyclopentyl bromide intermediate, which we could form into the Grignard reagent again, just as before, using magnesium in diethyl ether. So this gives us the cyclopentyl Grignard reagent. And now if we want to perform our Grignard reaction, we could add this to the original aldehyde, To reduce the carbonyl, but if we do that reaction straight, we would actually end up with this product here, where we actually get a mix of just cyclopentane, as well as this kind of gross product with an aldehyde, so the carbonyl group has not been touched, as well as just OMGBR over here. So remember that Grignard reagents are sensitive to protic functional groups, which means that we have to find some way to deal with that alcohol before proceeding with the Grignard reaction. One very useful way to deal with that alcohol is to protect it. So we can take the aldehyde, the starting material, and treat it with tert butyl alcohol with some sort of acidic catalyst. So I'll just write H+. This will form a protecting group on the alcohol, giving us the tert butyl ether. And that gets rid of the protic functionality which will allow us to perform the Grignard reaction without any issues. So now, let's add this to the cyclopentyl magnesium bromide that we synthesized earlier in diethyl ether again, following up with an aqueous workup. To add that cyclopentyl group to the aldehyde, giving us the alcohol, as well as the tert butyl ether at the end of the chain here. Finally, let's add this to some aqueous sulfuric acid, which will accomplish two things in one step. First, it'll deprotect the ether, so it'll give us the alcohol again, and then we know that sulfuric acid can form ethers from two alcohols, so this will actually close the ring, giving us the six-membered tetrahydropyran ring here. And remember, intramolecular reactions are very fast compared to their intermolecular counterparts, which means that this reaction will proceed probably pretty cleanly. So I hope this video gave you some extra practice on retrosynthetic analysis using alcohols, Grignard reagents, epoxides, things like that. If you liked this video or learned anything along the way, please like and subscribe to my channel.
like me on Facebook at Total Organic Chemistry, and take a look at my website on the screen. If you're willing and able, consider donating to my Patreon page, which really helps me continue to create this content for all of you. Thanks for watching.